Okay, that was good, yeah. Hey, um, thanks for the talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, I understand why um, we would want to teach uh, non-cognitive dispositions that would like help people in a just society or something. But I'm wondering what the argument is for not teaching dispositions that are only helpful in an unjust background, like assertiveness or docility or something. Is it because we don't want to change how people like naturally are, or we don't want to like shape people is like why why not right good um so i think there are two reasons why not and well let me say there are two reasons speaking against doing so though i think ultimately um we might be justified in some cases in doing so so the two reasons are first the one that i was um, touching on here that you might exaggerate um, conditions of undermines the legitimacy of our political institutions because people aren't being sufficiently reflective about authority in that society or something like that. But I think the second is that if we really think of a society that we're open and supportive of a diversity of good lives, we might be um, undermining some children's capacities to lead certain kinds of good lives. So the case of assertiveness the individual and your individual needs is not as important. Uh, and then they go to the school and they're being taught, be assertive, you know, make your needs heard. And they go back home and that there's this tension. And if you really think our educational institution should be respectful of, say, that collectivist orientation, then I think we have a problem if, if we're our liberals in that sense, where we want a diversity of good lives. Um, I think that in the case of uh, so I argue for this in some of my other work, but I think in the case of students who are um, very impoverished or are in conditions of really severe disadvantage, we might be able to justify something like that, but um, only because the alternative is so much worse. Oh, sure. Okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> now I have to whisper. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> uh, this has been very uh, informative and touching and, and actually uh, thought-provoking for me. Uh, it reminds me that what, you're, what you were describing there, which was your non-cognitive behavior, uh, well, it's not new. 65 years ago, when I was in elementary school, we had it. Mm -hmm. So I can speak from a first-person response. You have an artifact of 65 years later. Grading non-cognitive behaviors exacerbates the harm. If it's possible, you understand the effect of class, but if anything, one has to be born into impoverishment, which is not only material impoverishment. Uh, it is emotional and cognitive impoverishment. Where there is no reinforcement, where assertiveness is seen as disobedience. One who has not been born into that cannot understand it. And it never goes away. People adjust. But the adjustment is its own distortion. Now, we have interest in this, and I think it's wonderful. I, when people knock public schools, I almost, you know, public school was, was in Washington, D.C., from a very impoverished, the way I'm describing, was a, was a magnificent thing. And I also lived, I graduated from CCNY, from Queens College. And this was an era a golden era that people now don't know. Everything was available from, 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 uh, from uh, 
undergraduate to graduate school, and it was all free. Don't tell people now if they get angry at you. Anyhow, I just want to I just want to express this: that to understand, and it's now interlocked with race. The majority, it, it's more common in, in blacks and in people who come from, from racial minorities. But to understand what that means at every level and to think that schools can have a major impact, I wish it could and it can have some, but we have to understand the limits. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're completely right. And part of my larger project, I do, um, I, I, I think the factors outside of the school, the institutional factors, factors of inequality, um, put severe limits on what schools can do. I do think there are some programs inspired by this work that are having some success. And I mean, and just to kind of anecdote. I see it in my classroom. So before I taught at CCNY, I taught at uh, Swarthmore College, right? It's a very nice liberal arts institution. And uh, the students were great. They were, you know, had, they were very smart, very academically motivated. Um, but they also had this, they took control of their education, right? They would come into my officer's hours and say, oh, I don't know if today in class this worked for me. Like, explain it to me. My students at CCNY, I have to push them to do this. They're not naturally inclined to do this. And I tell them these stories about when I thought it's normal, and they say, what? A student walked in and asked you what? They just can't imagine walking into a professor's office and saying, oh, you know, when you explain this, that didn't really help me. Like, explain it again or do it in some other way. They just don't have that mindset. And I think they end up uh, not having opportunities they would otherwise have in virtue of that. Um, so, yeah, I agree. Those factors are. This is just repeating Danny Weltman's question, I think, but a little bit more aggressively. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, look, I mean, th th the aims of education, suppose we focus on people who are sort of uh, you know, disadvantaged, low socioeconomic status and low ability, right? So, I mean, the cognitive skills you give me in school, I mean, are not, I mean, for the labor market and entrepreneurial success, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be limited, right? I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to do that well anyway. So, I mean, I think, so the, what are the aims of education? So, if we give priority to what are we doing for people who are probably going to end up living worse lives than other people on the whole, you know, low ability plus low socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. I think we owe more to those people, to us, and I think, I think what, what so I suppose I'm me, suppose I'm one of these people. What you owe me is not just cognitive skills, and I, and I certainly think, is, and so the, you know, one, one thing is, you know, I mean, so one thing I can get from school that will help me in later life is not just for labor market and entrepreneurial success, but, you know, skills that will help me for the rest of my life, or dispositions that will help me for the rest of my life. So mm -hmm. I might end up uh, working at a low income and uh, not very, mean, you know, meaningful job, but you know, there's meaningful stuff going on the rest of my life, and school prepared me for that. I, I'm a great climber or a great fisherman, or I've got a serious non-professional interest in playing rock music or something that sustained me over the years, or an ability to have friendships that, that last and stuff. And the, so, so, that, that, so in, in that context, part of what we owe people is, uh, it certainly you know, it includes certain cognitive skills, but also non-cognitive traits and dispositions that will help people for life success. And that means what we owe people is the traits that will help them succeed and the actual circumstances in which they'll find themselves. So all this justice stuff, I think, I mean, I, I think that's a terrible burden. I think, you know, here I am, I'm going to lead a terrible life anyway. And then you want to be training me with the traits that would work, give me a good life if I lived in a perfectly just world? That's crazy. In a perfectly just world, we would want people to be pacifists and turn the other cheek and train people never to use violence in any social setting. That would be, that's what we'd want. But that's, that's not the way I want you know, to train any middle class kids, and it's not the way I want to train working class, or work, you know, my working class kids either. So it seems to Good. me, uh, we, oh, we, oh, we owe people, co you know, these, these non-cognitive things. I mean, and th you, know, you think docility, you know, if I need docility on the job, I mean, look, if, if I, you know, think of it as anger management and not lipping off, having an ability not to lip off, I need that in order to keep my job and not get fired. I also need it in order to lead a protest at work, right? You know, I need, you know, so, mm -hmm. you know, it seems to me, 
we need to train people in the skills and it, with a with priority given to you know, people who are going to end up worse off anyway. And we should be thinking in terms of what will help them with the lives and the circumstances they'll actually find and help them lead better lives. And that includes not just labor market success and this kind of stuff, but also uh, non-job, non, non you know, uh, uh, free time. Uh, you know, what, what, what's happening in my life is a whole kinds of skills for which schools can play a much better role than I think. Okay, good. So uh, a couple of things to say. One, I agree that, that what we owe these students is more than um, the minimal set that I've, I've talked about here that would pass this test. What I think is that you can't just argue for teaching those dispositions by employing an instrumental argument. I think then you have a lot to do a lot more work to say, yes, we're justified despite the fact that um, th teaching you this disposition might harm you in some ways. And I do think there are reasons to think this. So for ex uh, there's been some research done on um, Latino students who immigrate to the US. And the more assimilated they become and adopt uh, more of the middle class behavior that's encouraged in schools, they tend to have more trouble with their families. They tend to be less connected to the larger family that in Latino families usually you are, right? Like grandparents, cousins, etc. And another row also found this. So working class families tend to have um, uh, closer relationships with extended families that you don't see in middle class families. So I do think that we have reason to think that it's not just so easy. We're going to give you the skills that will uh, lead you to have a good life and you know there won't be any harm done in that process. I do think there are harms and then you have to justify those harms. So I don't think we can just say, well no, these skills are useful, whatever you know, whoever you are, whatever your background, because I do think that the middle class American labor market rewards a certain kind of person, right? That um, and there is another model, as you were saying, right, of how to be or uh, that some communities do have, but which get, um, get the short shrift, I guess, in the context of the educational institutions and the labor market. Um, and so I think you're right that I, I agree with you ultimately. There's an argument we can make especially if you're in dire conditions of injustice. We can say, these are the skills you need, and so you know, maybe in an ideal world you wouldn't need these, but you are in these circumstances now. But I think that's a th you need more to make that argument work than just say, oh, these are the skills that would lead you to um, uh, have a good life because those are the skills rewarded around here without running afoul of this other commitment we have, which is to respect a diversity of good lives. So that's where. I th I'm hoping I misunderstood what you were saying. Uh, because I believe, <laughs> I'm just hoping. Because I was thinking that you were saying that you should have the skills for where you think I might be. And because had not someone pushed me further, I would not have attended UCSD. Had not someone said, and I'm a 68-year-old, had someone not said, you can do this, you need to stretch, we will stretch you, here's how you get to become assertive, here's how you go ahead and speak your piece, I would not have been an alumni. So thank God somebody said to me, you don't just fit into this box that you're a single parent with two children. You can't go to college. You have to stay home and just take care of the kids. You need to fit in your milieu. I don't. I didn't. Thank God. No, I, I mean, and I, and I agree that, that it is, I mean, that it's great when, um, you know, and I often do this with my students where you point out to them, you're missing out on this opportunity because you're not doing the simple thing like going to the professor's office hours and asking them for help. Or, you know, and I, and I think a lot of the students want to achieve, as you said, you know, get a college degree, et cetera. I do think it gets trickier though. So, I mean, this is all anecdotal, but 
going back to some, sometimes I teach these uh, seminars for first year college students. It's CCNY, it's gotten better, but we have a really um, low graduation rate um, for our students. And so often a lot of them will drop out. And this freshman seminar is an attempt to get students to bond and we talk about college skills, not just you know academic stuff. Um, and what I find, I mean, the m most common problem I find with my students who are not able to live up to their college commitments is that their family obligations trump. And it's hard, you know, what do I say? I had a student like this last year. What do I say? You, you should put your studies first. And then she says, my grandmother's sick. I can't not be with my grandmother. I understand the pull of that. You know, I'm, I'm Latina, so I, I understand where she's coming from. Um, and so these students are constantly making these trade-offs um, that are difficult for them to make. And so in other work, I, I don't talk about this here, but in other work, I, I do talk about this issue that I think we have to think about the fact that students are making trade-offs. They're not um, just lacking their relevant skills. You know, they see the opportunities there, and sometimes they see what they need to do to get them, but there are these other commitments they have which make it difficult for them to make this trade-off. Um, I was wondering if you could go back to the slide of what you thought um, the skills would be in a... Oh, sure. Yeah, in the justice, and how you think that would um, be played out in a classroom. Like, how would you teach delay gratification, like, in a classroom or grade it? Uh, let me try and figure out if this... Okay. Ah, great. Um, good. So there, I mean... There is this really important question, like how do we go about teaching these skills? And Walter Michel and some of his colleagues later have done some of this by um, teaching kids uh, different, so for example, the kids that don't look at their marshmallow, right? They kind of start imagining something else or are able to distract themselves from the immediate temptation there are able to delay gratification longer, and you can teach kids to do that. Um, let me think about some of the other things I say there. And, and so I think I don't know enough about all of the ways in which teachers are trying to do that, but there are some programs that focus on this. So in, the, in Brooklyn, there's this famous public school um, there's a movie made about it in which uh, there's this amazing teacher that has a chess team that is like an amazing chess team, right? They, they, and these are um, kids from fairly impoverished backgrounds, but they manage to compete at these very high levels of skill. And part of what she does is go over the chess games with their after they've you know, been in a chess game and maybe they lost and say, look, here, what did you do? And the kid will be like, oh, it just seemed like the right thing to do. And she'll say, did you think about it? Did you stop and give yourself two or three seconds to think through that? Or did you just react, right? And so she'll help them see, you just reacted because right now when we're talking about it, you can see what the right move was. And the kid will be like, yeah, you know, I can see what I could have done. And so next time, you know, it's, it's complicated I, and I think you know, I don't have children, but from seeing my younger cousins, I think parents teach their kids this. And when you read in at LaRoe, you see that they teach them some of these skills, like planning. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the findings that uh, LaRoe has is that you see that middle class parents tend to fill their kids' lives with these massive schedules of extracurriculars, right? So the kid has to run from music class to ballet class to all of this stuff. And working class parents tend to let their kids just play. They'll just be like, you know, just be a kid and do your th And so the kids will come up with games. They go and hang out with their neighbors or they'll go to their cousins, but it's less structured. Um, there is a value to that, I think. But, uh, 
they're less familiar with this kind of planning than the middle class kids are. So yeah, I think it's a good question, how do we go about teaching these? But I, there do seem to be some people that have managed to do that. Hi. Thanks. Um, so I guess my question is about uh, the dispositions we're worried about. So you mentioned being worried about disposi dispositions that depend on potentially justice undermining um, conditions. And I was wondering, shouldn't we also be worried about dispositions that don't depend on justice undermining conditions, but promote them nonetheless? Promote, promote injustice. Injustice, so what do you have in mind? Um, I mean, I can't think of a, of a disposition that would do that, but you might think that even the ones that, that are up there, perseverance, delayed gratification, those are the ones that allow people to succeed in a world that is unjust and, um, uh, and uh, succeed as sort of members of a status quo that promotes the same sort of uh, uh -huh. underlying structural uh, uh, systems that are unjust. Yeah, so I'm trying to think. So you're trying to think of a non cognitive disposition that promotes injustice, but it doesn't depend on justice undermining conditions to do that. Right. I'm, one example, well, I'm trying to think. I was going to say one example might be the dispositions that are um, distributed according to class or race, but those would depend on justice undermining conditions. So I'm not. I mean, you might yeah, just say I that, haven't. Right? I, I'll have to think more about that. But yeah, I, I haven't thought of what is that? Extroversion. Oh, extroversion. Good. So the thing with extroversion is that I don't think it's um, necessary to lead a wide variety of good lives against a wide background of just conditions. I think. And it probably isn't instrumental for most, for, for a large variety of good lives. There might be instrumental for some. Um, yeah, but that might be a good case. I mean, I'd have to imagine a scenario in which that were true, that extroversion really just everybody wants extroverts or something like that. Yeah. Thank you.